Hi, Jesse. Thanks for being on the channel with me. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. I just wanted to ask you a bunch of questions about how you got started distilling at home and how you started your YouTube channel. Yeah, of course. Okay. Far away. All right. So, like, yes, how did you get started uh, with home distilling initially? Uh, I literally got started with home distilling because of the channel. Um, so it was kind of oh, a, really? yeah, it went, it went kind of both ways. I was working at a job that was um, initially really cool. And then it just all went south real quick. So I was working as a photographer, uh, but the job I was in, I had zero creative outlet. It was purely a technical thing, which is normally, normally fine for me, but it went from technical uh, solving new problems to technical sausage factory like just the same thing all the time no, nothing changing yeah. doing the same thing over and over again uh, and it went from a job that was it felt like the department um, they hired two of us two photographers and literally said we don't know what you do start the department pick your own equipment um, tell us what your job description is you know it, it was great and then it all just got shut down so I I was in sore need of something to look forward and to in my future uh, and also in sore need of creative outlet. Uh, so I decided to pick up a hobby on the side um, and also maybe a hobby that I could potentially put some time into while I was at work. <laughs> 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 uh, um, but the every other hobby I've had, I, I get really into something, I get obsessed with it, I put all this time and effort into it, and then I wake up one day, an hour later, uh, sorry, a, a year later, and I'm just over it. And then I've got nothing to show for all the time I put into it. So I decided if I'm going to have a hobby, why not have a hobby that may potentially turn into something, you know, that, that, that could get me out of that situation. That could be a job in the future. So I'd, I'd had these, this interest in cocktails actually was what started it for me. I really liked the idea of being able to mix cocktails and try different recipes on a cocktail basis. But I could never justify, you know, look up a recipe for a, a cocktail and it might have three or four different spirits in it. Um, and if you don't have any of those, that's, <laughs> you know, that's like 300 bucks that you got to go and spend. I was like, ah, oh, we're not going to do that. So I thought if I make my own spirits, then, I, you know, I can make spirits relatively cheaply uh, and make cocktails. It turns out that I got over cocktails really quickly and now I, I mostly just drink neat spirits. <laughs> uh, but the other side of it was was YouTube. And the the idea was that um, the two of them together, if I could get into YouTube, then the, that would sort of satisfy the geekery side of things, figuring out the algorithm, figuring out the technical aspects, and also the creative side of it too, being able to mess around with different aesthetic ways of showing what I was doing. Uh, so long story short... I'd never distilled a drop of alcohol when I started the channel. I, I started the channel before I started distilling. And the whole point of the channel was not to be, here's me, me good, me teach you. You know, that um, it makes sense if someone's been in the industry for years and years and years of whatever they are, you know, that they're, they're teaching about. Uh, but for me, that, that obviously didn't make sense because I didn't know either. So it was more a case of, I guess, come along with me while I learn. And what I am good at, I think, what, what I think my strength is, is, is finding information, repackaging information, and then sharing it with other people in a way that helps them get to the result faster than what I can, or well, faster than what I did the first time around, because I had to find it in the first place. So I guess I think that that's what I try and share my channel. Um, and here we are, four years later, I'm still doing it. <laughs> Yeah, that's crazy. But like, so you said you started distilling after you uh, started the channel. So like, how did you decide on distilling? Like, I mean, <laughs> if you're gonna make a channel, like you want to pick something you like, but then you didn't even <laughs> distill at that point. So you didn't even know if it was something that you would like to do. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good point. I, I mean... I'd been homebrewing for a long time. Well, not a long time, maybe okay. about three or four, three years, four years. Uh, and I <laughs> guess I just assumed that it was going to be much the same. It was, it was going to be an extension on that. I mean, literally half of it is almost identical, right? And then you just distill mm -hmm. the product. You don't add hops and then you distill it. You know, you don't 
package it, you don't keg it. Um, so I, I knew that I enjoyed that. Uh, but I, I, I'd also start to learn about myself that for me, my hobby is learning. My hobby is problem solving. So it almost doesn't matter what the, the, the subject matter is, as long as I've got the ability to keep challenging myself and keep trying new things, keep having ways to put myself into situation. Like it's, it's the whole cycle of you try something, it turns out horribly, you swear, you curse, you get really fed up, you get angry. And then people look at me and say, why are you doing this? This doesn't look like fun. But for me, it's just part of the process. <laughs> you know, like uh-huh. you've got to go through that process of being kind of fed up at something, or being frustrated at something, or feel like it's not working properly, and then you get a breakthrough, and then that feels amazing. So it it almost didn't matter what the subject matter was, and the reason I picked distilling was uh, I figured I had some start with brewing, so I had some skills that would transfer from that. Um, but the brewing space on YouTube was quite crowded i think compared to the audience whereas i noticed that distilling had Mm. a large amount of people that were hungry for information relative to the amount of people that were creating content Mm. for Uh, and then in a huge part was because it's illegal in most other places right for people to do this at home Mm -hmm. Uh, and being here in new zealand i had the opportunity to just be really open about it and not have to hide behind any um, this is for educational pur- purposes only or you know any of the other stuff that some other people are forced to do uh, so I sort of saw that as a um, a large opportunity and the the inverse side of that the, the problem with that is that uh, it is quite a small community as well so I, I think people making videos in the space are never going to be you know they're never going to be the next Linus Tech Tips or MKB uh, MK BHD. Oh my word, I've forgotten. Marcus, anyway. Uh, you know, they're not going to be millions and millions of subs, but they have an opportunity to serve a really niche community that's starved for information. Um, that was what, that was how I felt when I started the channel anyway. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, that's really cool. Oh, yeah, that's really cool. Like, um, <laughs> so you mentioned you had other hobbies before you got into distilling. What were the other things that you tried beforehand? <laughs> oh man, there's a long list of of things. Uh, I mean, there was sport. I used to surf a lot. Uh, it was one of the okay. the things I did with my dad. Pretty much when there was surf, we'd mm-hmm. go out. You know, before school for me and before work for him all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, really fond memories of that. And then traveling and where we ended up living just kind of kind of killed that. There's not. A great amount of surf here uh, and the small part of me that was still addicted to surfing got killed off pretty quickly when we had kids <laughs> there just wasn't time oh, in the day I for see. it <laughs> um but that might be something i'd look look to get back into uh skill toys have always been a really cool hobby for me i've, I've really enjoyed skill toys so um contact staff double staff uh yo-yo i was into yo-yo for a while um kind of things that cross the line between skill toy and sports. Um, so like table tennis, I was into a lot because you can kind of mess around by yourself pretty easily. Pool sort of falls into that category as well. Snowboarding. Uh, tech stuff. I love tech stuff. Um, this is the the tech slash skill toy uh, buzz for me at the moment. So FPV quads, they're an amazing outlet for me. I, I like things that you can kind of zen with, things that you can get into flow state with. Uh, and, you know, obviously as I'm getting a little bit older, surfing and snowboarding and skating, <laughs> this is not so great for me anymore. anymore. It hurts when I fall over. Um, so being able to just stand there and then pretend like I'm doing it, but it's something else doing it, that's, um, that's pretty cool too. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, um, <laughs> so you got into distilling. Um and you built your own still at home, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. How how many stills do you have right now? Uh, oh, uh, I had to. Someone asked me this question a little while ago, actually, and I actually didn't know the answer until I sat there and worked oh, it out. <laughs> it's not that bad. Uh, we'll start from smaller stops. So the smallest one I've got is the little Chinese pot still, which is I think 
mm, maybe six or seven liters and it's literally just a stainless pot uh mm-hmm. with a, you know a, a column to line arm that comes over through a kind of one of the almost like an old school um pot and worm condenser uh that's great for little mini runs of gin testing things out stuff like that uh what's next then i've got the t500 and i got that one mostly because i saw a lot of people just because it's available everywhere it's the one commercial like the one commercially made home distilling still that you can buy almost anywhere uh, so I thought it would be smart for me to get it and try it mm-hmm. just to be able to, you know, talk to that community. And turns out I actually quite like it. It's not not a horrible still, to be honest. It's pretty decent. Um, with a, And with a few little modifications, I think it would be great for a lot of people, especially if you just want to plug and play, get into it solution. Um, then I've got a claw hammer still, which is similar to the T500 in terms of size, but it's quite different in terms of its uh form factor i guess so it's a it's more of a milk can uh pot or boiler and then everything above it is modular uh so it's got little you can get little i think it's one and a half inch bubble caps and you can put as many of those together as you want it has a uh, options for a stainless pot head copper pot head stainless and copper um columns and it has little accessories like a gin basket and stuff. So that's that's pretty fun as well. Uh, on the side of that, uh, the same company makes a really cool alternative to something like a grandfather. Um, so it's a, mm-hmm. basically a, a, a brew in a bag setup, but instead of being a bag, it's all stainless, like a stainless grain bag and stuff. That, that's really cool. Um, what after that? Uh, then I guess it's the still that I built. Uh, just to be clear, I built everything above the pot or the boiler, uh, mostly out of copper and stainless steel ferrules. But uh, one of the guys that was instrumental in helping me, I guess, break into the hobby to help me get past that really steep learning curve was uh, really generous enough to donate the pot as well. So he built that. I did not build it. Um, and he did a really good oh, job of it. Yeah, so that that's built out of a fifty liter beer keg, and it's got two two kilowatt elements in it. I've got some uh, four kilowatt ones there, but I need to rewire, <laughs> put get the Sparky to put in some more wiring for it as well. Um, and then I have a Genio, which is similar to the iStill, and that it's a, I guess like, like a, an automated still, more in my opinion, sort of aimed at creating a lot of neutral and doing it relatively hands-off and being able to press a button and have it repeat mm. the same process over and over again. Um, and that's just not really me. Like uh, I'm not into that kind of distilling so much. And let's face it, everything I do in the shed that's distilling related, I really need to get content out of. And it's kind of boring. <laughs> you know, once you've done that once, what are you going to do in terms of making a video about it again? Mm-hmm. Um, but what it does have that's really cool is a, a jacketed, pot so i can throw literally porridge in there and distill on you know stuff that's really really thick so i did a a grappa in it that is that was more skins than it was liquid um you know like i opened up the the ball valve at the bottom to get out and it just went uh, (laughs) and stopped and it didn't scorch you know so being able to being able to just to distill things that are that thick gives you a lot of um creativity freedom i guess to be able to do different things uh so i think that's it so one two three four five five stills at the moment that's not too bad yeah it's not too bad. no yeah i'm yeah. sure it'll grow so what yeah. <laughs> uh so i'm just wondering like since you're learning while you're distilling what is like the biggest disaster you've ever had I can't really think of one off the top of my head. It's mostly frustrating stuff. Like I, I haven't had one of those, oh, I forgot to close the ball valve and dumped my, dumped my entire wash onto the to the floor. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> I'm sure I will eventually. Uh, but it's things like the last time when I, the last time I fired up the claw hammer still and I was making gin, I got everything 
put together and everything ready to go. The still charge, everything in the botanicals basket, basket, turned the still on, nothing happened. And then it's kind of a case of you want to run the still because you want to make the gin, but I'm also on a schedule to make videos. And mm. I'm inevitably kind of bad with that. Like I, <laughs> I don't have... I don't have a buffer at the moment, so I don't have two or three videos sitting on YouTube ready to go live. So when 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 we finish this interview, for example, I'm going to jump off. I'm going to edit the video that's going to go up tomorrow, <laughs> which is bad. I need to I need to make a buffer. Oh, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah. So it doesn't work. And you're like, okay. Um, what do I do now? I need to make this video, and then it's the long problem solving process of. Is it the electrics? Is it my controller? Is it the yeah. one of the cables? Is it the elements? You know, what is it? And then trying to, which, like I said before, is actually fun for me. I actually really enjoy it. But with that added pressure of you need to get the video out, so you need to get this sorted, you know, in the moment, it's it's kind of frustrating. I'd say things like that are the, the, the biggest issues I've had. And that one, for example, was just the element had blown, um, which isn't too bad when you're working with a, you know, small uh, hobby distilling equipment because you can just literally pick the still up, <laughs> tip, the, you know, tip all the, the charge or the wash or whatever out into a bucket, pull the element out and, you know, fix it, put it all back together. Um, yeah, so that's about the worst thing I can think of, which makes me think I've got off really light. Maybe I've got a bad one coming. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I thought you'd have like, oh, I had a big, big explosion or something happened once. So I'm kind of surprised. No, yeah, no, no. No, nothing really. yeah. Since you're like, you were a brewer first, how many years, like when have, when did you start brewing beer? Oh man. Um, I mean, I initially started, uh, my wife and I, my then girlfriend were managing a backpackers down in the South Island. And mm -hmm. uh, the the people that taught us the job, the the guy before us was brewing beer uh, on location, so he showed me how to do it as well as, as part of the <laughs> part of training. Uh, but that that was pretty rough and raw. That was like kitten kilo stuff, and no, you know, barely any sanitation. Definitely no temperature control. Um, you know, it was all just coming out of jars and mixing sugar and alley me with with water basically uh but when i got back to back up into the north island uh, about halfway through studying uh, we backpacked for 10 years so we we studied pretty late um i decided to pick the hobby up again and one of my buddies at that point in time uh, was winning national home brewing competitions and obviously kicking us at it and he basically said well if you know if a friend of mine's going to start brewing he's going to do it right and he came up and, and spent a, a i think a day and a half with me just giving me a super crash course on it and that was kind of the beginning of me mm -hmm. really getting into the hobby i guess um that guy ended up he mm -hmm. he's opened his own uh brewery now called brave brewing which is yeah they, he does some really good stuff so if anyone's in new zealand or coming to new zealand when they can again <laughs> uh, make sure you swing past hastings and, and hit up brave brewing for a, a pint and, and some food they're, um, they're well worth the stop so between brewing though and distilling which do you prefer then oh man um it's like asking to choose which of your children you love the most <laughs> um Right now, I'd probably say distilling simply because I, I've kind of gone off beer a little bit. And in, in fact, I I don't drink that much anymore. I very seldom we have more than maybe two drinks at a time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, every now and again, you catch up with an old friend or you have an excuse. You gotta, you're got to away from the kids or whatever and you kind of cut loose a little bit more. But um, yeah, I guess I guess spirits just sort of fit into my lifestyle a little bit more now. It's really easy to to sit down after a, a meal for me and and sip on a whiskey, and it's kind of like it's the best of both worlds. It it's like dessert, but it's you know twenty five mils, forty mils of whiskey, and you can sit there and enjoy it for half an hour. Um, it, it, yeah, it's almost more like a treat than it is 
an alcoholic beverage, <laughs> but you, I don't know. I just, it, it fits in with what I enjoy more at the moment. Uh, and I guess because I enjoy drinking spirits more at the moment, then I enjoy the process of making them more because I'm more likely to be, you know, thinking about the last whiskey that I really enjoyed and man, that, that was really delicious. How do I go about making something like that? I, I think that process of drinking is more often than not a process of me thinking about, um, what it was that they did to that whiskey to make it taste the way it did. And I think it's actually interesting because because of that, I more often than not, I would rather drink a whiskey that I've never had before and I think might be interesting for some reason than I would then I would rather drink a whiskey that I know and love. So it's almost like it, I don't know, sometimes I just want to drink it because it's delicious and I don't want to think about it. But a lot of the time it's fun just to drink something. Um, even if you know, you're maybe not going to like it that much just to sort of be able to pull it apart and think about it and um, yeah, it's back to that problem solving thing, I guess, and sort of pulling it apart, trying to discover what they've put into it, look at the results and then figure out how, you know, how to import that into what I do. So yeah, I think, I think distilling, sorry. So wait, take that, what should have been a really long, uh, short answer and make it really long, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> distilling, I think at the moment. Because, like, we both have distilling YouTube channels, I'm, like, really curious about your journey in this. So, like, how has... You've done it for four years. So how has this channel, like, kind of changed your life, if at all? Oh, oh dude, it's completely changed the entire family's life right now. Um, right. For the longest time, and when I say the longest time, about three years the first three years mm -hmm. it was well the first the first i think it was about a year a uh, year and a half at, at that first job that i described to you uh it was great for the okay. family because the, the amount of effort and time and just personal resources i was putting into that job was pretty low because i the writing was on the wall we all knew it was going down the toilet um so it wasn't a huge impact on the on the family uh, because it wasn't taking up a lot of bandwidth for me personally. So I could still come home and, you know, and, and have like all of my resources for the kids and f for the wife and stuff. Uh, but when that job mm -hmm. did finally die and I moved to another job, uh, the next job was awesome. I loved that job. And it took a lot of resources from me uh, in terms of bandwidth during the day, but also just the amount of hours I was working there. So that was sometimes 60 hours a week and then coming home and doing another anywhere between, you know, 15 and 40 hours a week on still it and trying to put my heart and soul into both. Mm -hmm. So that was tough, man. That was real tough on the family. Uh, and I tried to quit at least two times seriously. And both times my wife, my wife kicked my ass and told me I wasn't allowed to quit still it. <laughs> so basically without her, this wouldn't have happened on many, many levels, but just pure encouragement was one of them. Uh, but then COVID rolled along, and unfortunately, that job that I loved uh, had to they, they had to let me go, and they made the right decision for the company. And I, mm -hmm. um, so there was no you know hurt feelings there, um, and still it pretty much made still it and chase the craft pretty much made the entire COVID thing not an issue for our family. So if, if, if I didn't have that, if I didn't have that side hustle that was sitting there and slowly building up, ready to turn into wow. a full-time gig, wow. we would have been stressing out, man. Like we would have lost three quarts of our family income with no other way to generate wow. it because no one in my industry was going to hire during the, mm -hmm. um, you know, I say during COVID, like it's not a thing anymore for us luckily it's really not i understand that for other people that's not the case so um sorry for you guys but yeah and now i get to hang out at home it's it's 10 30 on a friday morning for me and instead of being at an office doing someone else's work i get to hang out here and talk to you which is freaking awesome i i mean i yeah i don't know man I, i'm so lucky to be able to be in contact with people like you that are on the other side of the planet. We, our paths never would have crossed. You're doing really cool stuff. That's and, true. And that just, you know, 
that is awesome in and of itself. It also means that um, if my wife's sick, I can just go and drop the kids off to school because she normally drops them off on the, on her way to work. Uh, or if one of the kids has a you know something that's important in their life coming up, I can just rearrange my week and do it. I never used to be able to do that stuff before. Uh, okay. So yeah. I'm really lucky to be able to do this. The family's really lucky. Um, or, or I shouldn't say the family's lucky. I, I'm lucky that I'm actually able to be the dad and the husband that I should have been before and I wasn't able to. So I was kind of stuck in the, the rat race, you know. Yeah. Um, that's probably not the answer you were looking for, but for me, that's that's the biggest thing that the that this whole YouTube thing has given me is the the ability and the flexibility to be the person that I want to be with my family um, and to be able to meet amazing people that I never would have been able to meet in, in you know, uh, another life, another lifetime. Um, yeah. Those are the things that have, that have literally mm. changed my life. Uh, and can I ask, was like, there a moment when you thought, yeah, like, I'm going to be able to do this and make this uh, YouTube thing a full-time career. Yeah. Um, yeah. When COVID hit <laughs> and I was forced oh. to, so it, it, I mean, it had been growing really steadily. Uh, and uh-huh. I guess the, the thing that I was proud about with the channel was that I grew it steadily and it wasn't, mm-hmm. you know, one hit wonder where a video had taken off and, given me more exposure on YouTube than I probably deserved. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I was proud of that. But also at the same time, that was the biggest downfall of it was that I was just growing really steadily and incrementally um, Mm -hmm. without any explosive growth. Um, But it was looking, starting to look like uh, right, right before COVID hit, it was looking like there was potential for that to happen for for me to get to a point where I could quit the day job. Mm -hmm. And we'd been having discussions with myself and my wife pretty, pretty close to just before COVID struck, um, talking about what we were going to do about that. And it was sort of looking like maybe a, looking at perhaps a two year exit strategy where I'd sort of grind for another six months or a year and then slowly start to back off, maybe go to four days a week, you know, and then slowly back it off, uh, but with that safety net of the salary still coming in as well. Um, and then mm-hmm. COVID hit, lost the job, and the potato vodka video took off all at the same time. So, I I mean... I and, saw that, yes. Yeah, it went crazy. And so that that was a that was a huge... Those, those things together uh, were kind of like, a, yep, we're mm-hmm. doing this. You know, you don't really have a choice. Uh, you could go looking for work. You could go stressing about it. Uh, but, or you could just put all that time that it would have taken you to look for another job and work at another job and just put it into the channel and see what happens. Uh, and it, it, it was just a perfect storm that all came together at this, at the perfect time. Yeah. Like what about the other skills? Like you learned distilling while you were doing YouTube, but what about the social media side of things and the video editing, uh, and the videography? How did you learn those skills? Yeah, man. Uh, it's a pretty big leap, right? Like, I mean, I've. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, it's nice to talk to someone that 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 gets it. Uh, it it's tricky, man. I, 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 I guess, I guess it's just a case of you need to do it, so you do it, and you you learn on the job. Uh, I don't know what what have you been doing? Like, where have you been getting inspiration to improve with that sort of stuff? The editing, it's all on YouTube. And then, yeah, my first video, it was, I think, like three minutes long or something. It took me like over, well over a hundred hours to make that. Yeah. And it's so bad looking back at it now. And you're like, oh, God. Yeah. It's just That's YouTube. So I learned everything on YouTube. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I guess uh, initially for me, it was a case of I have no idea how to do that. So Google literally how to do that or i don't even know mm-hmm. what's because the hard thing is when you don't know what you don't know right you don't know what you're missing you don't know what you're bad at 
and you don't know what's possible. So Mm -hmm. where do you start? You've got nothing to hang on to. So I just literally started Googling how to edit. (laughs) Enter. Oh, that looks interesting. (laughs) I'll follow that. Um, And then it evolves a little bit more into you see something in in someone else's video and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. I like that. Yeah. But then you, but then you don't know what it's called, right? You see a cool effect, and you're like, "Oh, I don't know what, I, what, what, what do people call this thing? It's a, it's a, it's a zoopy effect, or it's a." <laughs> you start typing random words that make no sense, and then eventually, after five minutes, five hours of googling, you find it. You get the the the, the tutorial, and you, you know, you you learn how to do that very very narrow thing, and then you graduate past that a little bit to the point where you see something cool in a video. But I guess you've got enough tools yourself to have an educated guess on how to just recreate it. Mm -hmm. Now that you know it's possible and you've seen someone else do it and Mm -hmm. you've seen that aesthetic, then you can just go ahead and and it might take you 45 minutes an hour to work it out, but you can just kind of make it happen. Um, And I guess I'm starting to get past that that second to last sort of stage and into the, the, the last stage. Uh, I had, I guess I had the advantage of coming from a photography background and as a photographer, I was very, very heavy on lighting and technical side of photography and editing. I was never, you know, an artist sort of style photographer. Uh, so I was, mm-hmm. how do I put it? I, I knew what worked aesthetically. I knew how to frame things. I knew how to light things. Mm-hmm. I knew how to make something look good as a static image. So then moving to video was, I guess, it, it, it's mm-hmm. similar to learning how to brew before you, before you learn to distill, right? It's kind of um, mm-hmm. exactly the same, but nothing like each other both at the same time. Um, yeah, so that, that helped a lot. Mm-hmm. But it, you're so right, man. I look back now at my first, especially the first 10 videos, and it is just so bad. <laughs> so bad. I think... The, the biggest thing for me is so, learning how to talk to the camera. I, I mean, like, is that still weird for you now? Do you get a camera out and look at the camera? Yeah, that's, just that's always weird. It's just like you're <laughs> looking at a bubble and they're like, oh. <laughs> it, uh, it took, yeah, that yeah. took probably a year and a half, two years to get over. And now, now it's totally, now it is yeah. normal for me. It's easy to talk to the camera and just pretend it's yeah. a person. What else do I want? Your channels are very, very big now. Almost 150,000 subscribers now. Uh, so yeah, yeah. do you have any help now? Have you expanded your team? No, I haven't. Um, it's, it, it, it's funny too how YouTube is one of those things that's so relative. Like when I first started, oh. I, I said, if I get to... 500 subscribers i think it was in the first year then i'm allowed to keep keep making videos if i want to after that mm-hmm. and and then i remember thinking like oh my god 10,000 subscribers that's so crazy you know like 1,000 wow 1,000 then 10,000 and now i'm like i'm not a big yeah. youtube channel what are you talking about i'm tiny have you seen those guys like <laughs> you know there's millions and millions and millions of subscribers on but it it, it it, it, it's a it's a nice reminder to um, I don't know it's it's one of those nice things that is a I, I guess it applies to a lot of other parts of your life too where you're just don't compare yourself to other people compare yourself to yourself and just keep improving. Okay. Do like do do you know what I mean? Because I'm sure you felt the same, right? Like you see that first person subscribe and you're like, wow, I've got a I subscriber. Know. And now you think back and you're like, that's hilarious. I had one subscriber <laughs> and then you had 10 and then a hundred and, and now you're at a thousand. And if you keep, keep going the way you're going, you're going to keep growing because you're making awesome content and you'll look back at this in a, in a year's time and it'll feel like nothing, <laughs> you. you know? So it's, it, I don't know. It's weird. Sorry. All of this is, 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 is me being nervous when someone says you've got a large YouTube channel because the little naysayer in the back of my head's like, no, you don't, no, you don't, no, you don't. <laughs> Um, but yeah, sorry, I completely went off track and I forgot what the question was there. Um, uh, I asked you if you have any help now making your videos, oh, like editing, yeah. that sort of stuff. No, I still do everything. 
literally everything uh, myself. Oh, well. I I looked at getting someone into edit, um, but the problem is my my process is very. Me talking to the camera is my draft, mm-hmm. and then I write the final script when I'm sitting in front of the computer editing, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So when I'm talking to the camera, I might do it four or five times, and the first time it's like, that was stupid. Let's just pretend like that didn't happen. You just completely talked out of your ass for 15 minutes. Uh, so I'll say it again, and then I'll start. Sometimes I'll just nail it first time, but sometimes it'll take four or five times. And sometimes I'll get to the end of it and think back and go, no, nothing that I said was correct, but I've got all the pieces that I need and what I said to, to edit it later on. Uh, and then if you sort of move that forward to the, to the editing process, if you have someone editing that doesn't understand distilling, there's no way they can do that. Do you know what I mean? So if I say something that's really stupid oh. at the beginning, mm they might just go and throw that in the video because they don't know any better and you can't expect them to. So, so I I either need to find someone that knows distilling and editing, uh, and I guess YouTube as well, which would be tricky, uh, or I need to change my process and the way that I go about it, which I think is probably more likely. Um, what is starting to happen, though, more and more is my wife is starting to, to help out uh, with the channel a lot more. And she she used to be in the music business um, back in America before she moved out here. Uh, and a lot of what she did then was sort of orientated around logistics, around setting up events, around communication. So she's starting to do more more stuff for the channel like that. Uh, and as that, I mean, the the goal is to have it sort of grow out past just YouTube and to be a a company where YouTube is part of it, but there's a lot of other things happening. Uh, as that happens more and more, having her on board mm. with her set of skills, which are very, very different to my set of skills, are uh, that that's going to be uh, invaluable. Um, but I guess the key part is I've got to keep making content too. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I would love to. I'd love to expand the team. Uh, well, to create a team, I'd love to bring some people in to to basically let me do more of what I do uh, with the same amount of time that I have. Uh, but it hasn't happened yet. It's a tricky one. Yeah. So just on the topic of content, how do you come up with these video ideas and what to distill? <laughs> um, I don't know, man. It's just, it's, it feels like it's always different. I, I've got a to-do list that is a little bit different than most to-do lists, and it's I guess it's mm-hmm. it's focused around how easy it is for me, or not how easy, I should say, how quick it is for me to get it from there's an idea, like a one-line idea, through to the video has been uploaded. So obviously the, the, the easiest part of that is just a talking head video. So um, pick a concept, give my thoughts on it, uh, perhaps ask some questions of the community to try and stimulated discussion or legitimately because I just don't know certain aspects and I'd like other people's input. Um, and I mean, I can turn a video like that around in, you know, in a, in a day easily because I'm not waiting on anything. But as soon as distilling's involved, now you're waiting for fermentation time and you've got to find time to run the still and, you know, the, there's a lot of time there. So I kind of get settled, sorted into three three columns of a day, a week, and a month kind of rough timelines. Um, and I use uh, OneNote just so I've always got it with me. Whenever, you know, wherever I am, I can just pull it up on my phone and throw it in there. And it is just a case of you'll be in the shower one day and go, oh, I wonder what would happen if, you know, jump out of the shower and put it on the list or I'll be talking to someone else or, you know, there's a – a crew I actually see now that bedded and board has just messaged me and I've got no idea what he's <laughs> he's saying. Um, but it's probably distilling related and he has some really cool ideas too. You know, we, yeah. we talk a lot together. There's a couple of local distillers here that I talk a lot to. Uh, my wife is not interested at all in distilling, uh, but she loves whiskey. So, you know, quite often we'll be drinking something together and she'll say something that'll spark an idea. Uh, I guess the, 
the um i guess what i'm trying to say is that i don't often i don't often find myself in a position where i need an idea and i have to create one it's more i just try and mm. um I, I've tried to get good at catching ideas when they come to me, <laughs> if that makes sense, and squirreling those away for, for the for the time that I need them. Uh, and then, honestly, the biggest the biggest problem I find at the moment is the motivation to start those projects that are in the far right column of they're going to take maybe six weeks or something to to make. Because when you're on a schedule and you need to get a video out, uh, it's so much easier just to yes. focus on the video in front of you rather than investing you know, maybe two days of your time in terms of ideation for a recipe, designing a recipe, planning a recipe, buying the ingredients, getting the ingredients, making a mash, getting it all down. You know, you get all that done and you're still a, sometimes maybe a month away from the video coming out. Um, excuse me. So it's uh, that's, that's the thing I'm trying to work on most now is just that motivation to keep starting things. Once it's started, it's easy, but starting's the difficult thing for me. Mm-hmm. How does that work for you? Actually, I imagine that's uh, like how often are you creating an idea and then sort of finding a way to make it happen, or is it more that things are just happening in the distillery and you know they're going to happen, so you kind of co-opt them to turn them? Do you know what I mean? To to turn them into content. How that's what I do. I yeah. just co-opt them. It's because uh, things are always happening in a distillery. So you're just like, oh, that's that's a good video. Oh, that's another good video. So yeah, it just yeah. comes really organically. Or I'm a lot of times I'm just documenting myself working. So that's easy. I just I'm at work and I have the camera beside me. It's like my other arm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how how's your how are the employers about it like is it kind of a case of yeah do whatever you want uh but if you put four hours into making a video today then you owe me four hours tomorrow or are they kind of seeing it as free advertising or what's the how does that dynamic work well i'll say when i the first when i first started the channel it was kind of like i had you know 10 subscribers that were all my friends and then <laughs> they don't really see that as an advertising opportunity so i actually i had some holidays and i took those holidays and i would come to work on those days just to film my other coworkers working um yeah, so that was a bit rough. Um, so I just at work, I, I shoot it. And then at home in my free time, I'll edit it. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That yeah is awesome. That's how it worked for me. You've got such a cool opportunity yeah. being in the industry. I mean, I, I, I was thinking about this last night. There's you. There's the Whiskey Vault slash Whiskey Tribe guys. Mm-hmm. And there's um, mm-hmm. uh, Mark from Silver Fox. That that's it on YouTube in terms of people making content from behind the curtain, um, you know. And then there's a few ass hats like me, who's some dude in the shed somewhere <laughs> that's just making random stuff, which is very different than doing it, you know, when there's literally a a profit and loss sheet coming at the end of the, you know, the quarter or the year based on, on what it is that's being made while you're you're filming. So that's really cool, man, uh, and. Let's face it, the, the Whiskey Vault, the Whiskey Tribe guys are not doing the sort of thing you're doing. That's entertainment that happens to be from a distillery and happens to kind of be about what they're making. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's pretty exciting. You've got such a huge opportunity to to show people a side of the industry that's just never really been shown before. And it's cool to see, it's really cool to see the industry being more accepting of that. I, I don't know. I, I hope that there's a big change well, there is a big change, and it has been changing, but it's whiskey, so it, you know, oh. and it's distilling. These things take time. <laughs> but yeah, do you, do you see? Yeah. yeah. Is there a lot of um, cross pollination and cross discussion? Um, is it a really small world in terms of do you, like DC you self having yeah. access to other distilleries that you're not working at because because you're in the industry? Does that make sense? Yeah, so that that is my hope that my subscriber, as my subscriber base grows, when I approach these distilleries that I don't uh, have any contacts with, 
they can see like, oh, like a lot of people are watching her. So it's more worth it to, mm. her, to bring her in and to allow her to shoot. Or else if you just have no one watching, then like what's the benefit for them of yeah. you coming in and doing it? So that's my hope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's pretty and cool. I also just want to say though, like uh, don't count yourself out as a home distiller because <laughs> like at the Shakespeare distillery where I worked, uh, the distillers there and the people, my coworkers, they watch your videos to learn from you. <laughs> Just so you know that. <laughs> yeah, they're fans I, of you. Yeah. Uh, David and Sam, if you if you see them in my videos, you'll know. Yeah, uh, they're your fans. Like David and Sam. Um, yeah, that, that's always bizarre to me. It's so bizarre to me. I, yeah. It's, it's weird because you don't... <sighs> How do you put it? It's such an insulated thing. Like, it's just me. Literally, I'm a Herbert. I don't leave the house. I leave the house to go to the shed. <laughs> and then I come back to the house. And every now and again, I run out of something and I go down to the shop and buy it. Uh, or I drop the kid off at school. That's about it. Like, I'm, I'm, I don't go anywhere else. So it's very, um, I don't know, it's bizarre to be running into people in the real world that even know that I exist let alone that have oh, watched okay. the video or watch videos regularly. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's yeah. a strange thing. It's very odd, <laughs> but it's cool. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of, uh, professional distillers that watch your channel to learn from you about distilling <laughs> because it's not like they have all this knowledge beforehand. They're just figuring things out just the same as you. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, the, the thing about distilling is that, the, the more you learn about it, the more you realize is there's no such thing as a master. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when I say, I mean, obviously there's masters of distilling that just do what they do. They're the best in the world. But what I mean is you, you take someone like me, right? And my thing is I never make the same thing twice because I can't mm -hmm. make content out of that. And maybe I'll make mm -hmm. it two or three times to really, mm -hmm. you know, to dial something in and then I've got to move on. Mm -hmm. That's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum is someone who's been working at, you know, one of the big distill, like the master distiller or distiller at Lefroy or mm -hmm. Ardbeg or something. And they, they are literally making the best products that they could like make from that within the, the parameters they have. It's the best in the world, you know, mm -hmm. but then you ask them how to make grappa. Like what's grappa? Right. I know barley, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not saying that for sure. I like maybe the, maybe the guys there, maybe there's a guy there that used to be work with grappa. I don't know. But my point is it's, it's almost like the more you specialize, the more you cut everything else out of your life. I, do you know what I mean? So it's kind of a, a case of you, you, you can't know everything because if you spend so much time learning everything you can learn about whiskey, then you've got no time to do, to, to learn about, something else or if you spend all of your time like me learning as wide as you possibly can then there's no way that i can learn the intricacies of what mm -hmm. a master the distiller that's making bourbon or scotch or you know i i, I there's just no way i could know mm -hmm. everything they know and it's kind of depressing on one hand because it's like well you'll never you'll never get there there is no there like it's not going to happen mm -hmm. but then it's also really exciting because you're never going to run out of things to learn, right? There's always something new to pick up. Um, yeah, I don't know. Right. If, if, if I knew what I know now about distilling and, and that part that I just described, mm -hmm. that would be the answer that I gave you right at the beginning when you asked why I picked distilling. I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> now I do, and now I'm happy that I'm in the distilling space because of that reason. Mm -hmm. So can I ask, content-wise, where... What direction is your channel headed? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, the, hmm. <laughs> how do I ask this? Let's go, you always know you've asked a good question when someone does that. Uh, going back to what you were asking earlier about how I learned YouTube, there was a few channels that I watched that were YouTube channels. And what I mean by that is that, that literally – Channels on how to make a YouTube channel, right? Okay. And if, if people are out there thinking about getting into YouTube, I strongly suggest finding, you know, at least four or five of them and um, 
putting in some time with them. But one of the biggest things that stuck with me from those days that I, when I was watching that is that the idea of different videos for different reasons, I guess is what I'm driving at. So you've got videos that are there solely to make, well, not make them happy, but to appeal to the, the, the core viewers, the people that just tune in every week at the same time, you know, watching your channel as part of their routine. <laughs> so making videos for those people. Um, then on the other side of things, on the far end of the spectrum is making videos that get your channel discovered, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes those things appeal to the same people, but sometimes they don't. Uh, so updates on what's happening in my life and what happened in the past, you know, I made this thing six months ago and now I'm tasting it to tell you what it's like. Someone who's just discovering me doesn't give a flying fornication about that. Uh, but something like the potato vodka, like yeah. I've got potatoes. I like vodka. I can click yeah. this. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I'm trying to sort of get a little bit better at dividing my attention between rotating through those those mm. types of videos and trying to create discoverable, clickable, mm. more, I hate the word, but virally kind of, you know, things that are just there for the masses mm -hmm. that are, that are a, uh, a way to bring people to the channel mm -hmm. uh, and sort of paying homage to the people that have let me do this as a job. The ones that are uh, the, the regulars that watch a lot that contribute to discussions and help other newbies out in the, the questions down below and, you know, like doing stuff that they enjoy too. So I'm trying to get better at that. Uh, and the long and short of it is that, uh, I guess I'm getting to the point now where I've covered a lot of the bases in terms of the basics. So I feel like I can expand out and I can do more weird stuff, mm -hmm. which is fun. Um, so um, <laughs> distilling ramen, with, I mean, why you would ever do that, I don't know. I'll never do it again because it was okay, but it wasn't exactly delicious. Uh, but it was fun. Now I know what distilled ramen tastes like. you know. So I'll try and sprinkle in a little bit more like that. Um, I'll try and keep keep the more geeky things going, but I guess the thing I'm really looking forward to is when when world travel opens up again. Uh, I would love to start doing um, more of the kind of stuff that I did in Texas. So being able to just roll up in a location, have a couple of people that uh, ideally like. I mean, it'd be awesome to come and come to your part of the world, right, and do an mm -hmm. actual person collaboration with you get some connections go out and visit a bunch of dis distilleries or whatever um in that area that that is interesting to distilling so maybe it's a i don't know like a fruit grower that's supplying a distillery or um, uh i can't think of anything else right now that bad example but <laughs> you know like like just get past the this distillery i go to distillery you know like expand past that and just start to see what distilling is for different people in different parts of the world um, oh. and sort of collect that and have that as a uh, inspiration piece for everything else that I do. Right. Like, so okay. um, now that I've distilled rice once, well, so that's a good example, right? Like I wanted to distill rice, wasn't entirely sure how to go about it. That led me to looking at yellow, the angel yellow label yeast, which mm -hmm. the stuff's for the listeners that, that don't know the stuff's a miracle as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. uh, no mash, <laughs> no sugar, and it just ferments. So mm -hmm. the thing, the video I'm about to edit right now mm -hmm. is literally, I took a sack of wheat and a sack of oats and mm -hmm. threw it into cold water, pitched some of this yellow label yeast into it, which is not just yeast. There's other stuff in it, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. and walked away. And it fermented by itself, uh, which is absolutely bonkers. So it's more than just enzymes because it's gelatinizing it as well. I, I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I don't know how it works. But now that, that, how do I put it, that need to, or that drive to figure out what to do with rice, mm -hmm. I went through that process. Now I've got this other little tool on my tool belt, which is this yellow label angel yeast that I can use for other things. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier as well. I don't know what I don't know. I've never been to a Scottish distillery in person. I've never been to an Irish distillery in person. I've never talked to those people. I've never been 
to people making brandy and cognac and like mm. all these crazy things. And I just, I feel like every time I can go and see what they do in person, mm-hmm. it, it, even if it's not a physical product or, or like a physical idea, maybe it's just kind of a concept or a way of, look, of looking at things mm-hmm. that I can gleam or, or take from that person. It's, it's mm-hmm. just one more thing that makes everything else I do so much more exciting. Uh, another example is um, uh, visiting the Licorice Brothers from Iron Root. I mean, I got a lot from them, actually. They were amazing. If you're ever in Texas, you, you, need, to, you need to go to Iron Root, guys. Uh, but uh, they talked about, I think, uh, what do they call it? Alavage, I think it is. And that was the, the concept of raising a barrel. So like literally raising it like a child. So instead of the idea of taking spirit and putting it into a barrel and then you forget about it until it's okay. X years old or you just taste it until it's where you think it is and then you pull it out, you literally raise it. So you, you look at it, you taste it, you, you, you change its position in the warehouse, you add water to it, um, you take it out of that barrel and put it into a different barrel. You, you, know, the, the, you treat it like a living thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that concept to me, I wouldn't say it was foreign at the time, but it 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 put inklings that I had in my head into words that I could really hold on to. Mm-hmm. And if they hadn't explained that to me, I, I wouldn't know that, you know. So <laughs> once again, a really long way of saying travel is going to be awesome, uh, and I really look forward to being able to do that with the with the channel when we're able to. Have you ever thought of maybe like contacting a TV uh, show and seeing if you could have like a distilling TV show or something? Like that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I I did I did I entertained the idea for a little bit. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, I just kind of feel like why don't I just do it myself? Like I I don't know if there's I don't know if there's anyone that can pay me enough money to to give all of the, if it was my show uh-huh. and they're footing the bill and I get to do whatever the hell I want and go where I want and yeah. record things the way that I want and not put that ridiculous reality TV bollock spin on everything. Maybe, maybe, but at the same time, why don't I just do it for myself? Like, why don't I just do it low budget? And I don't know, but yeah, I, the, the idea of basically doing a, a um, do you know, micro dirty jobs? Did you ever see that? Mike Rose did he jobs? No. Um, basically, he just rolls up at a new place and, um, you know, works at a distillery for a while. Oh, sorry, works at a random, you know, he might be mining or a mechanic or a plumber or whatever, you know, and he, mm-hmm. he just literally chips in. Something kind of like that. Um, but uh, there's also Jeff Bradford. Do you know Jeff from uh, Beer One and Spirits? Have you seen his channel? I was watching your podcast just uh, before right. we started this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, very interesting guy. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much what he does. So I would very much need to find my own spin on it and not just, you know, cut his lunch. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess um, I did think of a couple of ways to change that and do it a little bit differently. Uh, and and you know not step on his toes because he's doing awesome stuff, man. If 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 you're list if if you're out there in internet land and you're listening to this or watching this and you haven't checked out his work, make sure you go and do it now. Uh, I think probably the easiest video of his to find would be the tequila one. Hmm. Um, but yeah, he just he rolls up and he spends time with people. I mean, all the stuff I did in Texas, it was like a day. Like I'd, I'd go and talk to them real quickly and you know, get a good quick video and then move on to the next one the next day. He'll go and spend weeks with people and literally mm-hmm. make product with them. Uh, and he's got a really cool crew that, that make really cool um, aesthetic videos out of things too. So yeah, if, if you're listening to this or watching this, make sure you go and check, check his stuff out too. It's really cool. Mm-hmm. I want to also ask, like, do you have any advice for anyone who's thinking of getting into distilling? Oh man. Um, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, how long have you got? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> <it's> a, 
<laughs> we'll give you, we'll give you the concise one. The concise one is uh, I think the best way to go about it is learn the safety stuff first. Get that like get that seared into your head so you don't even have to worry about it. Uh, and the the reason I say that is distilling is not something that you can just get into and be mm. distilling by the end of the day. That's such a huge learning curve. Mm. And it can be quite intimidating for people. But I think if you can if you can learn the safety stuff and know that everything you're doing is not a safety concern, then the worst thing that can happen is you make something that's not delicious mm-hmm. or you just make something that's not alcohol. <laughs> you know, like if you somehow really screw up. Mm-hmm. And it's not the end of the world. You, you move on, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think the next thing after the safety stuff is to really look at what, you are excited to make because there are so many different worlds in distilling, like similar to what we just talked about, right? Mm -hmm. But it goes all the way back to equipment too. So if you're going to go out and you're going to buy equipment, I would suggest that before you do that, you really think about what you're excited to make. So if you're someone who's just really into um, whiskey or even brown spirits in general, I loosely group them. So any of the whiskeys, rum, um, anything that's kind of pot stilled and oak aged is, is what I'm getting at. If you're into that, then you're going to go down a certain path when it comes to the techniques you're going to use and the equipment you're going to need. If you're really into vodka and gin, that's a different route. Um, so if you figure out what you're excited to make and then start looking at the equipment that makes those things, then you're going to narrow down um, – the things you need to learn and the things you don't need to learn to get started, but also you're going to have equipment and some knowledge on hand to be able to start doing stuff that's going to get you excited much, much quicker. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then other than that, uh, get onto the forums. Uh, Home Distiller is probably the biggest one at the moment. Um, Get onto some of the Facebook groups find some people on YouTube to watch, but most importantly, find at least like three different versions of information. So find Mm -hmm. three different, like find different people that you can look at because it it is one of those things where there's a lot of um, contradicting information out there, I guess. And if you, if you just blindly follow, and I'm saying that don't just watch my videos, don't do that. Like find other people that say things that, like find someone that says I'm an idiot and then figure out their perspective and their argument, figure out my perspective and my argument and figure out like why one of us is incorrect is what I'm saying. Cause you, yeah, it's, it's not worth just blindly following one um, subscribed way of thinking, I guess is what I'm saying. And then after that, man, have fun, get stuck in, uh, keep on chasing, keep on grinding because there's, you're never gonna fit you're never gonna finish. <laughs> you're gonna keep yeah. learning. <laughs> oh wait, no. I did think of another question just Fire to away. like um do you now that you're so big, at least from my perspective, <laughs> from my perspective you're huge. Um <laughs> do you have like people like uh, messaging you all the time or when you walk out, just has anyone ever noticed you? And they're like, that's that's Jesse from Chase the uh, <laughs> Um, Yeah, it happens every now. I mean, I never leave the house, like I said, so that That's doesn't happen very often. <laughs> uh, but it does. It does happen from time to time now, um, which is bizarre to me. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, yeah, messages are a real problem. I, I mean, I prioritize the the Patreon messages. Uh, I mean, those are literally the people that are supporting me. So I kind of feel like that's only right to, to prioritize that. Uh, I, I get to Facebook. Um, I just despise Facebook in general, to be honest with you. I only ever use it for messenger and I use it a little bit for, um, um, you know, I, I have a page and I throw stuff up on there every now and again, but it's not something I really do actively. Mm-hmm. So honestly, I, I find it pretty hard to ever get to the bottom of the, um, the pile of messages on Facebook. Uh, mm-hmm. just cause, it's tough, man, and it, it's. I'll be honest; I don't reply to everyone. Um, mm-hmm. You'll get people that just expect you to to give them. Like people, 
will write and be like, what's your phone number? I need to call you and ask you a question. I'm like, dude, that's not happening. That's, that's <laughs> this is just weird. Not so weird. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't know you. I've got no idea who you are. Um, you know, or people will be like, uh, I want to get into distilling. I haven't actually Googled it yet, but tell me everything you know. And you're like, no, dude, if you're not, you know. So I, I yeah, I um, I do vet the messages a lot now in terms of if you seem like a cool person that is actively trying to help yourself and you need, you know, like a little help to get on your way, then yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I can to help you. And sorry, it might take me two or three weeks to get back to you, but I, I will try. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a tricky one, man. I, yeah, I, I don't know how to handle that. And as it grows more, it's going to yeah. get to a point where I just can't. Yeah. And that's sad to me. Uh, it's the same with the comments on YouTube. Um, it used to be up until I prided myself up up until probably the beginning of COVID of trying to at least acknowledge it, pretty much every mm-hmm. single comment, you know, even if it's just giving a thumbs up, moving on or, mm-hmm. you know, writing a quick comment or actually trying to help people out in the comment. Mm-hmm. And I just can't anymore, which is sad. It, it really is sad. And it's mm-hmm. just, it's part of growing and I don't, I haven't really found a way to, mm-hmm to kind of square that away with myself yet to, to like mm-hmm. not feel shitty about it. I haven't found mm-hmm. an output or a, or a way to, um, yeah, I don't know. To, I guess it's not, not to justify it, but to find something else that I can do instead to, to mm-hmm. still, to still try and interact with the people. Cause I think that's mm-hmm. really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is too, that now that the channel's a bit bigger, there's just so many more trolls, like so many more. Uh, mm-hmm. And that actually used to be one of my guilty pleasures. I used to love messing with them. I, oh, it was okay. so much fun because uh, my goal was never to, yeah, it was never to actually be like to fight them on their mm-hmm. their terms because that's just silly. Why would you? Uh, but who was it? Or oh, someone I was talking to, uh, someone I was listening to recently on a podcast was saying, oh, I can't remember what it was. I can't remember who it was. It might have been a comedian, actually. But they're basically saying, dude, you're on my platform. I am literally like a god. You you, you cannot win this game in terms of, like, he was referring to trolls, like trolling oh. them on Twitter already, just because everything's stacked in your favor. So, yeah, it, it used to be kind of fun for that. If you want to, you can just ban them. You can block them. You, you know, <laughs> you can, yeah. I, and and it's, it's funny, too, because you just, you just, like, Every day again, like I said, it was my guilty pleasure. I'd sit there and interact with people and they'd have this big long like telling you you're an idiot for like 15 comments. And then you're like, thanks for the support, man. I really appreciate it. I'm not supporting you. Well, dude, you just gave me like 15 views on my video and 15 interactions. Uh That's making me grow. Thank you. I appreciate it. You know, there's just, there's literally no way they can win if you just keep your head up. Um, Yeah. But now it's getting to the point where I can't do that because there's so many of them. And I must admit, it gets um, it's hard to keep your composure sometimes, especially when you just log in to, to see like general feeling of a video and you scroll and you like you might scroll for like 20 comments and there's just 20 people telling you you're an idiot in a row. Oh. <laughs> it's hard to to balance that. Um, and it's just a weird human nature thing yeah. because I don't know. Have, have you found this at all? Like you'll, you'll have like 20 people saying something really nice or something constructive, or they're saying you're wrong, but they're going about it in a respectable way mm-hmm. and giving you advice on how to change or whatever. And then you get one person who's just a jackass. Mm. You forget all the other comments. And you're like, ah, this person, <laughs> do, have you found that? Like, do you get that? I think for me, like, uh, part of the reason I started YouTube was because I I thought I was too sensitive and I wanted oh, to right. develop thicker skin. And I so every time I see like, oh, someone's made a comment, I'm like a little bit scared to open it and read it because I like assume that they're all hate comments. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, it's been nice that most people have been really nice and supportive so far. Yeah. Nice for me. Yeah. 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 No, I, I still get the same thing. Like I'll, I'll, you get the, the worst is the notification and you, you only get like, I don't know how it works because I get 
comments pouring in all the time, but then randomly I'll get a notification about one. It's so bizarre. Yeah. I, I just, it's, it's weird. But yeah, you'll see something and it'll, you only get to see like the first three or four words. And I do the same thing. I always assume it's bad. Like it doesn't matter what those words are. It could be, dude, you're awesome. And I'm like, oh shit, what's the but? Oh no. Yeah, I'm really bad at it too. I always assume it. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, just the way way my brain works, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it is definitely a um, an exercise in I just yeah. I guess, like you said, trying to have a thicker skin, right? Mm, yeah. I if people so. are thinking about getting into YouTube, know that that is a thing, and uh, you <laughs> yeah, you need to deal with it. <laughs> Jesse, thank you so much for um, talking to me today, uh, doing this interview. Um, And I'll see you next week for our podcast together. Yeah, excited. Thank you so much for having me. And congratulations on, uh, on, first of all, grinding and like sticking to it for this long, but also on um, having some success. And I'm sure, yeah, it's going to start being exponential for you soon, (laughs) I'm sure. So good on you. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks for having me. See ya.